Good morning, working class. Um, welcome to Sex 101. Uh, today I'm going to be teaching you all about sex. My name is American Johnson. You can call me EJ. Uh, before we begin the lecture, I think you should all know that I have no credentials. Uh, I'm not qualified to talk about this, but I'm going to talk about it anyway. I have had sex before. I'm not very good at it. But that's really uh, not the kind of sex we're going to be talking about today. No, we're talking about sex and gender. I have terrible handwriting. That says gender. I might as well not have written it down at all. Uh, we're going to be talking about sex and gender. So let's get started. What is sex? What is sex? This sucks. This is really going to be a problem. What the fuck? What is sex? Let's define some terms. In this con, in this class, in this, uh, hmm. what is sex? Uh, well, before we can talk about sex, we need to talk about, um, before we can talk about sex, we have to talk about, shit, before we can talk about, oh, shit, it's all fucked up, huh? Before we can talk about sex, I want to introduce to you a concept of essentialism. So essentialism is the idea that objects or beings are imbued with a certain essence that defines what they are. I don't want to go too far down the rabbit hole with the fancy words. We're going to try to keep this all very basic and simple. But uh, this is a word you need to know and understand. So you may have seen one of these before. This is a hammer. And an essentialist individual would say that this hammer has an essence. It is essentially a hammer and it exists essentially for the purpose of driving nails and pulling nails. That is what a hammer is. That is what a hammer does. That is what a hammer has always been and will always be. There are, of course, reasons people might adopt this philosophy of essentialism as it pertains to hammers. A hammer was designed by a designer for the task of driving nails and pulling nails. So, you know, this, there is this idea that the designer, the designer's intentions help to define the essence of an object or a being. Um, but to counter-argue this essentialist argument that this tool is a tool, essentially, and has an essential purpose of driving nails and pulling nails, I submit to you subject B. Now this also could be described as a hammer, or at least a hammer head. When I bought this hammer, it had, you know, a, a handle similar to this one, and it sucked. It was really, it was a bad hammer. It broke really fast. It broke after like three days. Seriously. I used it like twice and it broke. So it wasn't good at what it was designed to do, for one thing. The first time I tried to pull a nail, that's when the handle just snapped off. And ever since then, I've been using this as a doorstop upstairs for the uh, laundry room. And it's been doing a much better job as a doorstop. It stops the door. Yeah, it's, it's been serving me well as a doorstop for several months now. It's much more useful to me as a doorstop than it is as a hammer. So the question is, does this hammer, did this hammer have the same essence? This is what an essentialist would have to ask. Uh, does this object have the same essence as this object? They were both designed by designers to drive nails and pull nails. They both have a very similar shape. 
And uh, you could assign the same function to both of them. In fact, I tried to do that. I tried to use this as a hammer. Uh, and it failed. It wasn't up to the task. Uh, it, it makes a better doorstop. So an essentialist might say that this object is imbued with the essence of a hammer, does what it's designed to do, serves the role that it was intended for, it has the essence of a hammer. But an essentialist would have to think a little harder about this. Did this at one time have the essence of a hammer and that essence changed or morphed somehow? into the essence of a doorstop? Or am I somehow abusing this object by forcing it into a role that goes against the grain of its very essence? These are all absurd questions. This is a silly freaking conversation. It's a waste of time. This freaking thing doesn't have an essence. Essentialism is BS and it's just, a, it's a bad idea. Now, it's especially a bad idea when we start to apply essentialism to human beings, okay? Because if I use a hammer as a doorstop, the hammer doesn't care. It doesn't care how we humans label it or try to define its essence. It doesn't have any thoughts or feelings at all. But when we try to assign essences to human beings, some terrible, terrible things can happen. So. Great example, not really what we're talking about today, but it does serve to illustrate the point. God, this sucks. Is racial essentialism, okay? And racial essentialism is the idea that various human races exist scientifically and that these races, all these different varying races have essences. And this was the source of a lot of the worst, most abysmal atrocities in human history, at least in modern human history, you know, because that's where you get things like, you know, the, the, the slavers, the slaving people of the United States and other cultures, uh, but especially the USA in the 19th century, used this kind of racial essentialism argument to justify human chattel slavery. And they said things like, and I'm not making this up, that's what they said. They said that black people have uh, an essence that makes them uh, innately, naturally uh, attuned to be slaves. It's really gross, disgusting stuff. It was used to justify uh, genocide and, and mass torture of an entire group of people for hundreds of years. Of course, the Nazis believed in racial essentialism. They believed that the Aryan race was essentially superior. They had a superior essence. They believed that the Jewish race had an essence that was inferior and, and uh, detrimental to society in various ways that led directly to the Holocaust. So essentialism, as we can see when applied to human beings, uh, it can get ugly. It can get ugly fast. And it can be used to justify atrocity. So we have to be very careful about essentialism and we have to uh, <laughs> dismiss it. <laughs> it's. It's a bad idea. There are more thorough critiques of essentialism uh, out there, and I, I could, I'll put some links to those in the description. Essentialism has also been injected into gender and sex theory and discussion, as we will see. But first, let's talk now about that first question we asked. What is gender and what is sex? You probably at least have a basic understanding of this, but we'll go through it quickly. So sex is usually used when we're discussing uh, biology, right? Okay, at least in the mainstream. Uh, so, you know, the, the traditional, uh, I guess, uh, most common belief is that there are two sexes, right? This is what everyone is taught in like kindergarten, first grade, right? Very first biology lesson, there are boys and there are girls, two sexes. Um, and then gender, we usually talk about with social theory, we usually don't talk about gender in uh, kindergarten or first grade. It's a little bit more heady because we're talking about social constructs and that sort of thing. So in the traditional worldview, and I should say the European 
derived traditional worldview. Uh, the gender of man is the social role played by the biological male human, and the gender of woman is the social role played by the biological female. Okay, this is the traditional structure. I'm so, I might as well not even be writing this. It's terrible handwriting, I apologize. So all this is horse shit, and now we're gonna talk about why it's horse shit. We're gonna start with sex, okay? Let's talk about sex, baby. Let's talk about you and me. When you're a professor, you have to have little gags and jokes that you introduce to by the time while you erase your notes on the whiteboard. So what makes a, we switched to black ink because the blue marker died, this is irrelevant. So what differentiates a biological male and a biological female uh, according to this traditional worldview? Well, of course, a male has a weenus and a female has a vajay. And uh, according to a traditional worldview about sex, any creature, biological creature, that has a ween is a male. Uh, and then any creature that has a vag is a, a female, okay? Uh, so this would be called a biological sex essentialism. Of course, we often shorten this to bioessentialism. So bioessentialists believe that scientifically and materially, there are only two sexes, and those sexes are male and female. A male has a weenie ween, and a female has a vajayjay. Now, let's talk a little bit about why this is important to a traditional bioessentialist worldview. It all comes down to reproduction. Okay, reproduction. That says reproduction. Uh, reproduction is where the weenie and the VG come together and they make a baby. So according to a bioessentialist, this is what defines organisms. You know, it's all about making them babies, using them weenuses to make a sperm that goes in the VG and then you have a baby come out of that. And that's what defines the sexes. Now, in the very specific context of reproductive function, this is kind of undeniable, right? I mean, yeah, it is pretty much a truism throughout at least the mammalian world that there is a weenus and there is a vajay, and the weenus goes in the vajay and that makes a baby. And in the context of reproductive processes, that is true. Now, we could say that it's a, a convenient shorthand to say that a, a pine is a male sex organ and a vagini is female sex organ. Uh, but really, that doesn't actually matter uh, because ascribing the quality of male to a pine and ascribing the quality of female to a vagine doesn't change anything, doesn't change the function. Uh, I just, you, know, I, you could just call it a, a penis and a vagina. And that's okay. Uh, it'll still do the same stuff. The panini will still make a sperm, and the vagina will still make a baby come out of it. So really, this doesn't matter in terms of biology or reproductive processes. These qualities really are meaningless. What do they do? They don't do anything. If I if I tell you that a a, a penis is a is female, it's going to have the same function. Right? If I said, if I, if I swap these around, I could say this is a female, a female ween, and this is a male vagini, uh, they're still gonna do the same things. When it comes to science, you know, the language is used to describe the function. The language doesn't change the function in any way, right? It's like uh, Comrade Ben Shapiro always says, facts don't care about your feelings, and the fact is, whether we call a penis male or female is not going to change the function of that reproductive process.
So really, these words from a biological perspective are pretty meaningless. They don't really say anything about the reproductive processes, right? So now here's the moment you've all been waiting for. Let's talk about my sex organs. All right, you may be curious about my sex organs. And today we're gonna to talk all about my genitals. So here we go. So we're gonna take a look now at the real world example of my actual genitals, okay? So let's take a look at my genitals. Wait, no, don't click away. I'm not actually gonna show you my genitals. That's against terms of service. Um, but we will talk about, we will be talking about my genitals to illustrate some of the points we're trying to make here. So uh, I happen to have a paninus, one of those. And a bioessentialist would say that because I have a penis, uh, I am a male and I serve the reproductive role of uh, producing semen. You've seen these folks before, these little spermos. So apparently, according to a bioessentialist, the reason I have a ween ween is to make sp sperm to go make, to go fly away and make babies. And here's the thing, I've never had a baby. Uh, I don't ever want to have a baby. I don't need a baby in my life. A baby would make me miserable. I choose not to have a baby. Uh, I've always used birth control and done everything that I can to avoid having a baby. So, um, does that change my essence in any way? Uh, another question is, do I even have sperm? I have no idea. I've never gotten another human being pregnant. Uh, that's just never been an issue for me. And I just really don't know if I have any sperm. There's a really good chance that uh, I have none of these little things, which would be awesome. I hope that's true. But it's definitely a fact that there are lots and lots of beings that possess penises as part of their anatomy and they do not produce sperm, they do not have babies. Uh, that doesn't just apply to humans. Obviously, there are dog penis havers that don't produce sperm. There are giraffe penis havers. Try to get that image out of your mind. There are giraffe penises. I mean, of course, the penis doesn't make, I know the balls make the sperm or whatever, all right? Uh, let's not get sidetracked by the balls, all right? The point is, there are quote unquote biologically male individuals uh, that do not produce sperm and do not have babies. Some by choice, like myself, some due to mechanical uh, situations, some just never have the opportunity. Uh, so the question is if a biologically male individual does not reproduce, does not ever use the penis to put inside of a vagina and never makes a little baby, does that somehow change the essence of the being? To go back to the hammer. A biological essentialist would, would use this analogy. A hammer is to a penis as driving a nail is to cranking out spermos and, and having little babies, right? And then you know have, you have things like my doorstop hammer and my genitalia fly in the face of that because this doorstop hammer never made a good nail driver and my Pepe is never gonna make a baby probably. So what does that mean? What does that mean for my essence? Am I still imbued with the essence of a male uh, simply by virtue of the fact that I was born with a penis? Well, some individuals are born with no genitalia or both genitalia. That's a biological fact. Go look it up. Uh, and what are, what are those? What is the essence of, of those individuals? You know, what, what would the bioessentialist say about an individual who was born without any reproductive capability or an individual who was born with two sets of genitalia, both of which definitely happen. You know, there's no essentialist answer for that. 
it runs counter to that essentialist idea that there are only male penis havers and female vagina havers, right? So that is why I don't subscribe to this idea that there are two biological sexes and every human being has to fall into one of those two categories, right? So look, you know, when we're talking about reproductive processes, we have to be able to understand that in general, you know, the, uh, the biological organ of the penis, the male quote unquote genital system creates sperm. And then that goes into the quote unquote female genital system and that create, and that goes in the eggs and it makes a little friggin' baby come out. As nightmarish as that scenario is, that's how it works. That, that makes sense when you're talking about the very specific system of reproduction. But then you try to extrapolate to human beings and you try to essentially label people and ascribe to them a sex. It breaks down. Uh, and it really doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you call a, a, a being that has a functional penis or a being that has a functional vagina. And then we also have to take into consideration all these other beings that have neither penis nor vagina or have both. The whole model of male versus female human being breaks down as soon as you widen the scope beyond the reproductive system. Okay. Now, there are things like the hormone systems and other biologically distinguishing characteristics that do generally, and I mean very generally, run between penis havers and vagina havers, right? But there's counters to all those examples, and, uh, and, and, and none of it makes sense in terms of trying to define an individual. So for instance, I have a beard, right? So a lot of people say, well, you know, if a, if a human has a beard, that's part of the male essence of what makes that person a male, right? But there are people who have vaginas and beards, right? These people have always existed, right? And there are people who have penises and they don't have beards. It happens all the time. I talk to people who have penises, they identify as men, and they see my beard and they say, oh, I wish I could grow a beard, but I can't, right? Um, I can barely grow a beard. Actually, if you see, if you look under here, I have little patches where I don't have a beard at all, right? You can see it there. That's like a totally bald spot right there in my beard. I have to kind of do a beard comb over thing to hide that, okay? So the question is, I, the question I would have for an essentialist is, is this... Is this part of my anatomy male and this bald part of my face female, essentially? You know, we're talking bioessentially. This part of my anatomy doesn't grow a beard, right? There's a big, huge bald patch there. I hate it, but yeah. Is that a female, is that a little female patch of my skin? Tell me, I'm genuinely curious. Or if I couldn't grow a beard at all, am I, am I not a man? This stuff, it's just as ridiculous to talk about beards as it relates to biological sex as it is to talk about penises and vaginas. Also, let's talk about hormones, all right? And this has come up, this has been a problem for me, specifically. I've had problems with this. Let's talk about hormones. Let's talk about the stuff that happens on the inside. A lot of bioessentialists say that hormonal differences are really what define uh, males and females biologically, right? So, one thing that tends to happen along a dividing line that corresponds to whether you have a penis or a vagina uh, is a, something called a thyroid condition, okay? Thyroid condition, thyroid problem. So thyroid is a major part, major component of your hormonal system, okay? And it tends to fall along lines where people with thyroid conditions are much more likely to also possess a vagina, to put it in the traditional worldview terminology, uh, women are more likely to have a thyroid condition. That's the way that uh, it's generally put into the medical literature, right? Now, I uh, happen to have a thyroid condition. Um, but this whole conception that women, right? I can't remember what a, women's, what a woman's symbol looks like. Is it that one or that one? 
It's that one, right? I don't care. Anyway, women are more likely to have a thyroid condition. And so when I was going around trying to get diagnosed as having a thyroid condition, I was having all of the symptoms. I was having dry skin. I was having fatigue, anxiety, all kinds of stuff. And I was looking this up. My mom also has a thyroid condition, by the way. So I was pretty convinced I had a thyroid condition. I went to doctors in the USA, and they wouldn't even test me because they said, oh, you're, you're a man, so there's absolutely no way that you have a thyroid condition. It's very rare for men to have a thyroid condition. You're probably just depressed. And they sent me to a psychologist, and that was a whole thing. It took me years. Finally, when I went to Vietnam, I finally found a doctor in Vietnam who said, okay, we'll test you. We'll... She listened to me. And she found out that she diagnosed me with an actual thyroid condition, right? So it is rare for a person like me who has a penis like I do to have a thyroid condition, but I have a thyroid condition, okay? So there are always going to be exceptions to all of these rules uh, that people try to set up to try to define essentially what a male and what a female is, okay? And there are men who have testosterone deficiencies. There are women who have estrogen deficiencies. There, you know, th this stuff does not fall along, neatly along these lines of male versus female, penis haver versus vagina haver, the way that quote unquote common sense might lead us to believe that they do, okay? So there's really no essence of a male, of a penis haver. There is no male essence of a penis possessor. For every quality or attribute that you would ascribe to a male, a being that possesses a penis, you're gonna find a lot of counterexamples, and I'm talking about biologically, right, materially. It's not about the way that I feel. I have a thyroid condition. I am not going to ever have babies. I do not use my penis for the reproductive system at all. There are people who have a penis and a vagina. These are material facts, and they do not care about our feelings. So because this whole idea about biological male and female sex doesn't hold up to even the most basic scrutiny, uh, we developed this concept of gender, okay? So gender is this social idea. It's an idea of a social role that we play, right? And so the genders would traditionally be defined as man and woman, okay? And uh, this, this idea of gender was fleshed out a lot by feminists in the 20th century, and we began to start to examine, through the lens of feminism, these genders of man and woman and the roles that they play, right? We talk about gender roles, but the whole idea is that we create gender socially, right? Through our culture, through our interactions with each other, that's what forms gender, okay? And lately we've been talking a lot about non-binary and transgender, okay? If we throw away that bioessentialism, right, if we just throw that away, we're left with the idea that gender is completely socially constructed, right? It doesn't have any kind of biological mandate to exist. It's something that we create in our societies. So the non-binary and trans communities argue that because being a man is simply a social construct and being a woman is simply a social construct, then the idea of gender is malleable. I don't know how to spell that, malleable, you can change it. Is it two L's, one L? I don't care. You can leave a comment, but I don't care. So you're just wasting your time if you leave a comment telling me how to spell malleable, I don't care. I could Google it if I care, but I don't. Uh, so the idea is that if I'm, a, if I'm a born and assigned male at birth, as they say, if I'm assigned as a man when I'm born, but then later in life I don't feel like that jives with me, if I don't feel comfortable with that role that society has assigned to me, I can assign myself a gender, or no gender at all, right? So a trans person might be somebody who, when they were born, had a penis. Everyone told them, their parents and their society all told them you're a man. They didn't feel comfortable with that. So later in life, they said, I'm not a man. I've never been a man. I'm a woman. And that's okay because gender is socially constructed. And I am, as an individual within a society, constructing my own gender. We all, under this worldview, we all construct our own genders, basically, um, or we have it constructed for us by society. And so there's this idea that gender is malleable, 
and therefore it's perfectly fine for somebody who was assigned male at birth to actually be a woman because it's a social role. It has nothing to do with biology, has nothing to do with essentialist nature of the genitals or whatever. Um, and then there's also this idea of being non-binary. And if you're non-binary, it means you don't feel like you fit into either of these social roles. You don't feel comfortable being labeled as a man. You don't feel comfortable playing the role of a woman. You're outside of that binary construct, right? And there are a lot of different ways that people express as non-binary. Uh, some people feel like they have no gender whatsoever. Some people are gender fluid and maybe float back and forth or fall somewhere in the middle between the traditional male, female social roles. Uh, and some people just don't even really comprehend these social roles, okay? And that's kind of where I'm finding myself falling more and more is just not even really comprehending these social roles. And I'll talk about that more towards the end of this lecture. And when we look at other animals and other mammals, this whole idea of gender being a role that is socially constructed really makes sense. Because for one thing, a dog doesn't know or care about its own gender. A dog doesn't have a gender. Because dogs don't have language or any other faculties or capabilities to construct gender. And therefore, dogs and apes and dolphins have all kinds of behavior documented that flies in the face of this whole bioessentialist argument. You have male dogs that gleefully have sex exclusively with other male dogs and have no interest in having sex with female dogs. You have female dolphins that only enjoy having sex with female dolphins. You have animals of all species that are born with a combination of genitals or with no working genitals, functional reproductive genitals at all. All this holds true. And so it's pretty clear that humans are the only beings that we know of that have genders because we're the only beings that we know of that construct things socially along these lines, right? But yeah, that's, that's the basic idea. The idea that because bioessentialism is full of beans and groundless, then gender must be a completely socially constructed concept. And if gender is a completely socially constructed concept, then what's to stop people from deciding our own genders for ourselves and having that freedom to self-identify our gender. Um, now some people who believe in gender also believe in bioessentialism, and then some of them do not, right? So some people who believe in gender believe that you know, a bioessentially a bio male being is a man, if it's a human being, and that a bioessentially female being is a woman if it's a human being, right? And that's where, they, that's where gender is derived from. It's derived from the genitals, okay? Now, because bioessentialism is BS, this whole worldview is also BS because it's built on a shitty structure, okay? There's no foundation to this because the whole idea of bioessentialism is BS, okay? Now, there are also people, and most of these people call themselves feminists, who do not believe in gender, and only believe in bioessentialism. And these, uh, these tend to be what we call TERFs, and we'll get to that more in a moment. But these are people who say that, you know, because I am a woman, I'm a female, I have a vagina, I am therefore a female, I am therefore a woman, right? I have a, I have a vagina, therefore I'm a female, therefore I'm a woman, and therefore I have a certain essence that makes me a woman, okay? And therefore, there's no such thing as a trans woman, okay? Because they lack that essence. By virtue of having a penis, they are not female, therefore they are not women. They lack the essence of a woman. And we call this whole concept being gender critical, okay? So if you ever see the term gender critical, that's usually what it's talking about. It's talking about a branch of quote unquote feminism that is critical of the very idea of gender. And they believe that gender is a component of the patriarchy, okay, that, that men benefit from the idea of gender because it denies women their essence of being a woman by virtue of being a female, by virtue of having a vagina. So these gender critical bioessentialist 
trans exclusionary radical feminists do not believe that trans people can possibly exist because it's impossible for somebody to change the essence of who they are. This is also built on a foundation of bioessentialism that is absurd. So we'll talk more about this. I just wanted to get this out of the way. There are some people who don't believe in gender. They tend to be trans exclusionary radical feminists. They tend to believe that men have the essence of being a man and that defines them in an inflexible, unmalleable way. And that if you're born with a penis, you're a man. If you're born with a vagina, you're a woman. And there's no such thing as gender. The whole idea of gender as a social construct is BS, that's what they believe. And of course, that is actually BS, right? This is all BS because it's built on the shaky foundation that is bioessentialism. So now that we've defined all these terms, we can begin to bring it home and talk about all the different branching philosophies that are derived from this discussion, right? So we already know about bioessentialism. Bioessentialism is the idea that you got a hoiny or a vagina, and that either makes you a male or a female, and that gives you an essence that defines you as male or female, and you have no choice in the matter. It's not socially constructed. You are essentially a male or a female, and those are the only two options, right? It's a binary. Um, you have the gender critical philosophy, right, which derives from bioessentialism. And this is where we get trans-exclusionary, radical, quote-unquote, feminists from. It doesn't matter if you're born with a penis and a vagina. It doesn't matter if you're born with neither. You gotta fall into these binary categories, and that's all there is to it. There's no such thing as an intersex person. There's no such thing as a trans person. That's what these gender-critical bioessentialists would say. All right? And these are silly ideas. Throw them in the trash. They suck. So running counter to these terrible ideas are some better ideas, okay? Uh, one of them would be the idea of gender role performance, okay? And I've talked about this more in other videos. I'll put links in the description. But long story short, this idea was uh, pioneered by Dr. Judith Butler, who is a feminist theorist, and Dr. Butler came up with this idea that really gender is a performance, right? It is a socially constructed performance and that what we do as human beings in our societies is we perform our genders, okay? And this leads to things like gender role enforcement, okay? Gender role enforcement is what happens when you are forced to play the role of the gender that you were assigned at birth, okay? And I've talked about this a lot. Uh, for me, I have had terrible experiences as a small boy uh, with people enforcing the role of male, of man, of boy onto me. And I talked about this a lot in another video. I'll put a link to my toxic masculinity video uh, down below. Um, but basically, Dr. Butler introduced this idea that gender is a performance and that gender roles are enforced and that this is oppressive because it forces people into categories that they might not be comfortable with. Now on a personal note, until about three or four years ago, I had no interest in any of this stuff at all. I never thought about it, I never cared about it. I didn't really know what feminism was. I thought feminism was kind of this obsolete idea that was no longer required by society. I didn't ever think about gender at all, you know. Never questioned my own gender at all. I was assigned male at birth and I just rolled with it. I never was critical, never questioned it whatsoever. Um, but more recently, I've started to analyze these things and really take a look at them, really pull apart all of these ideas that I had just taken for granted my entire life. And this has led me to a set of ideas that some people call gender abolitionism, right? Gender abolition, okay? so this does what it says on the 10. These are people that say we need to abolish the idea of gender altogether, okay? Because gender is a socially constructed concept. It doesn't exist in nature. It is. It runs counter to our nature, and it serves to oppress a lot of people, right? It oppressed women for centuries. Now it's oppressing non-binary and trans people. So let's just do away with the whole idea of, of, of gender altogether. Now, the thing I have a problem with this terminology, okay? And I don't have a problem with 
you necessarily, if you call yourself a gender abolition, I just don't like this terminology. I'll tell you why. First of all, there are some TERFs who are gender critical and they call themselves gender abolitionists. It's a small number of people, but they are out there, okay? Second of all, I don't necessarily agree with some people who call them gender abolitionists because they want to literally, their goal is to completely do away with the idea of male and female or man and woman or however you want to put it. They want to do away with those genders completely and basically make everybody completely genderless and just completely do away with the idea of gender. I don't personally agree with that idea because there are some people who are comfortable being a man or being a woman and they find that fulfilling, especially there, I've talked to a lot of trans people who, you know, being a woman is important to them. It's an important component of their identity. It makes them happy. And they're not hurting anybody and it makes them happy. And I, I can't find uh, any kind of real rational underpinning for denying people that happiness. So I don't hate people who believe this, you know, I can kind of see why they believe that we should get, do away with the whole idea of male and female and all be genderless, but I don't really find it practical or feasible, uh, especially not in the society that we live in. And you know, there are a lot of people that just, it's important to them to have a male or a female gender in non-toxic ways. So then there's a third group of gender abolitionists, and I think it's the vast majority of gender abolitionists who believe we just need to be more inclusive and understanding of the different ways that gender can be expressed and what we need to abolish, we need to abolish gender role enforcement, right? That's the most important thing. We need to abolish gender role enforcement. So I have adopted, and I'm using a different term. Instead of calling myself a gender abolitionist, I call myself a gender anarchist, okay? So the whole idea of anarchism, I've talked about this a lot on my channel, is that we want to do away with hierarchies. No hierarchies, okay? So you don't want to have any situation where one group of people has a lot of power over another group of people. We want to find hierarchies, especially unjust hierarchies, root them out and destroy them, dismantle them, okay? So this is anarchism as it relates to gender, meaning we don't want gender hierarchies, okay? I would say that gender anarchism includes as a foundational component gender role enforcement abolition, okay? We want to abolish the enforcement of gender roles. And we have as another component of gender anarchism is gender equality, okay? We want true equality among all people of all genders, and that necessitates gender inclusivity, okay? So we want to include people of all genders, however they might identify. So that would include cis people who are comfortable with the way that they were assigned at birth. That includes trans people who identify differently than the way that they were assigned at birth. And it includes non-binary people who don't identify with this binary of male, female, man, woman at all, right? So we have to include all those genders. We need to have equality amidst and amongst all those genders. And we need to do away completely with the enforcement of any gender role. So even if you identify as a woman, that doesn't mean you have to play the role of a woman. And now I want to talk to you about myself personally. We're going to get a little personal at the end here. Okay? Why I became a gender anarchist and why I have basically come to the conclusion that I am non-binary. Okay? So we talked about my genitals at great length. <laughs> I didn't mean to make that joke, but it's a pretty good one, huh? Let's talk about my gender. All right? So I was born with a penis, all right? Born with one of those. Um, I, got the whole, I got the whole package, you know? Um, and uh, on my birth certificate, it says I'm a male, a boy, a baby boy. I was a baby boy when I was born, according to the doctor and my parents and society. I was raised as a boy, um, and I had the role of boy enforced on me 
in every aspect of my life. You know, whether it was family members who were telling me to be tough, be manly, be a man, or uh, teachers who were telling me, you know, to be a good boy and have the manners that a boy should have, and uh, be a courteous gentleman, right? Um, everywhere I went, I went, I was in, I was in the Boy Scouts, which obviously told me that, you know, being a man meant you have to be able to take care of yourself, and being able to take care of yourself is a good sign that you're manly, right? So when I was born, I was assigned the male gender role, right? Assigned the male gender, okay? As I, as I grew, as I grew, became socially aware, became a social being, I learned to play the male gender role, right? I learned to play this gender role of a male. And this gender role was enforced on me, okay? So when I wanted to do things, which I did want to do, when I wanted to do things like sewing or uh, playing with toys that are traditionally played with by women, like dollhouses. I really loved dollhouses when I was a kid. I thought they were fascinating. Um, I was very, very happy when the Pee Wee's Playhouse playset came out because it was like a dollhouse that I could, as a boy, play with without getting any kind of... Because um, usually what I would do is if I would go to like a friend's house and it was a girl, or, or if I was playing with cousins who were, you know, girls, they would have dollhouses and I would just love to play with them. I thought they were cool. They were little houses. They were awesome. Uh, so then finally when I was like six or seven years old, the Pee Wee's Playhouse playset came out. And this was a, a playhouse, a little dollhouse, but it was gender neutral or maybe even more for boys to play with. So it was totally okay for me to play with that. Um, and I loved it. It was one of my favorite toys. I also loved to play with my G.I. Joes with this um, old Ghostbusters firehouse thing I had and I would like try to set up all the furniture and stuff. And yeah, I would also like set up like machine gun nests in it, but I also just like playing with the little houses. Um, so I had to kind of like hide and mask the ways that I played with some of these toys. Um, when I was a bit older and I got into sewing, I, um, you know, I had to use the excuse that I was in the SCA and I was making armor, which is really manly, you know, and I'm making garb for my SCA persona. But, you know, really I just liked sewing and I liked making clothes. Um, you know, I had long hair when I was younger, down past my shoulders. Um, I had people misgender me all the time. You know, I'd be in the hallway at my school and teachers and uh, secretaries or whatever would be like, hey, excuse me, miss. You know, that felt a little weird because it was like, I was being misgendered from the role that I was being expected to play. That was uncomfortable. I had people tell me I need to cut my hair. Um, so throughout my life, I had the gender role of male enforced upon me. And I was also learning to play that gender role and to hide or discard parts of my identity that didn't fit into that male gender role. Okay, so fast forward to today and I'm looking back on all this stuff and I'm starting to realize, you know, uh, what I thought was important to me, being a man, being a manly man, uh, having the strength of a man, all of that stuff is actually BS and it's built on this construct of toxic social BS, <laughs> to use the technical terms. Um, so for instance, uh, here's something I realized recently. You know, one thing that I love because I was in the Boy Scouts, I've always loved things like camping, right? I've always, th I've always loved things like camping and going out in the great outdoors and making bushcraft stuff. You know, I've always loved knives and that sort of thing. Well, the thing is, that doesn't make me a man and that's not only accessible to men. So Luna, my partner, you know, is a woman and she loves camping. She loves all the same stuff I do when it comes to camping. She loves going out in the great outdoors. She loves bushcraft. She loves hiking. She loves all of it. Kayaking, all of it. Right? So that's not something that makes me a man, and it's not something that's only available to men. And I went through all the different things that are important to me, and I realized there's nothing in my life that really defines me as a man. Okay? I have a beard, but there are women that have beards. Right? I like the way I look with the beard, but there are women who like the way they look with a beard. And so for me to say that, like, oh, I'm a man because I have a beard and I like the way I look with a beard, that erases the existence of those women who have beards and like the way they look with beards, or non-binary people who have beards and like the way they look with a beard. Um, you know, it, I can't say that I have a manly, masculine, 
beard, and that's what makes me manly and masculine, because there are feminine women who also have beards, and there are people who have no gender and also have beards, right? So I started to think about things like this, and I started to realize everything that I thought was important when it comes to gender and about my own gender doesn't even exist, really. Or it exists in ways that are radically different than what I was raised to understand, right? Uh, you know, we talk, let's go back to my genitals. Let's go back to my wiener. I'm not going to use it to make any babies, okay? It might as well not exist in terms of the traditional gender role of a man becoming a husband and having kids and becoming a father. None of that is ever going to be available to me for as long as, at least as long as I choose not to have children, right? And does that make me less of a man? I don't know, because does it make me a man to want to have children? People of all genders want to have children, right? Uh, there are people who identify as women who have a penis, and they have children, right? And they're mothers. They, they have a relationship with their children, a very intimate relationship, where their children call them mom, you know? How can I, how can I, if I try to say that because I have a penis, I can become a father, and if you don't have a penis, you can't be a father, and if you do have a penis, you can't be a mother, I'm, I'm, I'm robbing that from somebody, and I have no real basis for doing that, right? So the more I think about my own gender, the more I realize it's all built on a bunch of BS and social constructs, and just, and, and, and abuse, right? A lot of this stuff is built on abuse, and there are aspects of my identity that I have suppressed, and might never come back. I might have lost parts of myself through all of this. You know, I might have done more with sewing. And, you know, who knows? Maybe I could have been a, a fashion designer or something. But I intentionally didn't develop that skill as much as I probably could have because I didn't want to get labeled as being too girly or too feminine. And that was when I was younger and less mature. Uh, but, yeah, there's a lot of things like that. There are aspects of my identity and my personality that I have suppressed or that society has suppressed and I might never find those aspects of my personality ever again. So let's talk about what leads some people to becoming non-binary or becoming trans. And let's talk about dysphoria. Okay, and I am not a huge expert on dysphoria. And there are different kinds of dysphoria. Um, so there's body dysphoria is one, is one kind of dysphoria, and that's where you feel like you're uncomfortable with the body that you have, the physical manifestation of your body as you were born into it, right? And so some people have body dysphoria where, for instance, if I, if I had body dysphoria, I might be very uncomfortable with the fact that I grow a beard, right? And I might be very, and I might be much more comfortable with having a smooth face, right? Because that just doesn't feel comfortable to me. You know, some people, they feel very uncomfortable with the fact that they might have a penis or that they don't have a penis. Uh, they might feel very uncomfortable with the having breasts or not having breasts. You know, there might be, you know, major aspects of their body that causes them to suffer because it doesn't feel like they belong in that body or they don't feel like they jive with those aspects of their body. Um, I don't want to talk too much about this, though because I just don't experience this myself. So what I will do is I will definitely link to some videos in the description for people who talk more about physical body dysphoria. Um, but hopefully you kind of understand the basics and hopefully I didn't butcher the concept too much. Um, but this is a component that, that leads a lot of people to becoming trans, right? So it's like maybe you're born with a penis and it just doesn't feel right to you and you just don't feel comfortable with it, and you, you would feel much more comfortable with a vagina, that is a perfectly valid mode of existence that, that's fine. So yeah, we're gonna just, uh, we're gonna let people who know more about that talk about that. I don't wanna speak for other people, but what I can talk about is social dysphoria, and this is something that I didn't even really know existed until very recently. And now I know that it's something that I've actually had my entire life, even though I didn't know it existed. So social dysphoria is the idea that you feel very uncomfortable with the social roles that you're expected to play in whatever way. So for me, you know, part of it is this whole idea of being like aggressive, right? So all my life growing up in South Carolina in the USA where people are very, you know, there's, a, there's this kind of macho culture 
Um, it was always expected for me to be more aggressive and to go out there and fight and be tough and you know, be on the attack. And that's just never been me. And anytime I've been expected to play that gender role, I felt incredibly uncomfortable. Um, I don't like to do a lot of the things that it's expected for guys to enjoy. I've never really been that into like team sports. Uh, I've never been into a lot of things that were pushed on me when I was younger, especially. And there are a lot of things that I want to do or love to do that would be more traditionally serving the role of a female, right? In the traditional worldview sense. And so not being able to do those things like, you know, sew or be more, you know, being more sensitive, those sorts of things, those have all led to social dysphoria for me personally, right? So the more that I have really sat down and looked at my life, in my experiences of gender, the more I've realized that I just don't really associate on a very deep personal level. I don't associate with, I don't associate with or care about the role of a man. There are aspects of the male gender role that appeal to me. You know, going out in nature, and uh, building stuff and having a beard, right? Those are all things that are traditionally assigned to the male role in our society, but they're accessible to women and to non-binary people, to people of all genders, right? They're not exclusive to that male role. And then there are aspects of the woman gender role that I enjoy. Sometimes I like cooking. Sometimes I like to sew. Sometimes. I like to watch fancy British costume dramas and get wrapped up in all of the costumes and the romance of it all. Uh, I love romantic poetry, which, you know, when I was in high school, I had to basically hide that. I had to pretend that I wasn't really that into it, except with a few close friends, because if I was walking around with a Percy Shelley book when I was 17 years old, that's, you know, that could lead to trouble when you're in high school. So. Uh, yeah, I, I've just, I've started to realize that there are parts of me that fall more along the male quote unquote traditional gender role line and there are parts of me that fall more along the woman gender role line. I don't feel like I identify strongly with either. I also don't really mind being associated with either. If you called me a woman or said I was girly, um, I don't, that doesn't bother me. I don't care. It doesn't bother me. I really don't care. It doesn't make me feel like any sort of discomfort. If you, if you called me she, her, if you use those pronouns for me, or if you called me a woman, or if I, if you, if I was, you know, I, I've gone out in public dressed like a woman before. I've been in, in drag shows and that sort of thing. It's fun, it's fun to dress like a woman, honestly. It's, it's a lot of fun. I loved, I've, I've been in uh, like cabaret shows and that sort of thing in the past, and it was really fun, and I had, I had a good time. Um, and then I went down, you know, out to the local club afterwards and had a really good time, had a lot of fun. Um, I enjoyed performing that role. Uh, I really did. And then, you know, there are times when I really like to put on a suit and tie and play that role. Um, so neither of these I have any kind of strong emotional connection to. Um, and I also kind of perform both roles at different times in my life or even simultaneously sometimes. So that is what has led me to the conclusion that I myself, <laughs> I'm non-binary. And I never really expected this to happen, you know? I'm 30, almost 36 years old, my birthday's next week. Um, it's kind of a weird time in my life to realize that I'm non-binary, but it is what it is. I just don't care about the gender role of man, and I don't care about the gender role of woman. Now, I'm still very much at the beginning of this journey, and I still have a lot to learn, but one thing I'll say is that um, the non-binary community has been very welcoming of me. And I, I felt kind of almost guilty associating myself with that label of non-binary um, because I know that there are people who have it a lot worse than, me, worse than me. I know that there are people who have gone through much worse shit than I have when it comes to gender. Um, but they've told me that, and, you know, and now I'm finally starting to believe it, that I'm valid and it's valid for me to feel this way. Um, and that you know, even if I never really quite figure out how gender fits into my identity and you know who I really am, I think to some extent, maybe that's not available to me. 
because there are parts of my identity, again, that have been suppressed for so long or maybe even have withered and died. I don't know. You know, um, unfortunately, you know, let's talk about language for a second, okay? Because language is a big, big part of all of this. So this stuff is different for everyone, right? There's no universal case for any of this. But you, you, we have words that are loaded with emotion in our lives. So we have things like mother and father, son, brother, right? I feel like I do have an emotionally resonant connection to the word son. I am my mother's son. Okay, that's a part of my identity. I am my brother's brother, okay? Um, these are family words. They're, they go very deep into our psyches, right? This language is very close to the heart. Um, and I'll always be my mother's son, right? I will always be my brother's brother. And yet, I'm still non-binary. And that's valid. That's okay. You know, you could be a non-binary son. Some non a lot of non-binary people prefer, you know, like he, him, or she, her, Pronouns, right? Pronouns are a big part of this whole discussion. Um, and, and there are non-binary people who go by he, him, or she, her. There are non-binary people, like myself, who if you saw them walking down the street, you would probably just assume that it's a dude, and you could call them a dude, and you could call them he, him, and they would be completely comfortable with that, and that would be me. But I also, personally, myself, wouldn't care if you called me she, her. Other non-binary people would. We all have different relationships to these words, and that's completely valid. You know, some people, some non-binary people, if you called them son, it would cause dysphoria. They would be uncomfortable with that for whatever reason. Maybe not even for any tangible reason that they could articulate, but it would make them uncomfortable. Me, I'm very emotionally attached to the word son. But you also have to remember, this is the only language that we have. We only have mother and father and son and daughter. We don't have a non-binary word in our society yet. Uh, to describe offspring in, in such an emotional way. So while some of this language is starting to evolve now, and we're starting to come up with better terminology and new terminology to talk about non-binary people and to, to describe these relationships, when I was a kid growing up in the 80s and 90s, even if this language existed, it certainly wasn't mainstream, it certainly wasn't available to me. And I was assigned this role of son, I was assigned this word of brother, and they just kind of got set, stuck into my brain, into my psyche. Now maybe as the language develops and as the culture develops, as our society develops, I'll start to gravitate towards some other terminology, but really it doesn't matter. The fact of the matter is I can use whatever words are comfortable to describe myself, and so can you, and that's available to us, okay? We don't have to play these roles that have been enforced on us for so long, and that is the true road to gender equality. And that's what we should all, regardless of our gender, regardless of our gender identity, we should all be striving for gender equality. Nobody should be forced to suffer. And if you look at the statistics, trans and non-binary people suffer a lot. There's a very high suicide rate for trans people. Uh, trans kids suffer from depression, and, and adults suffer from depression in huge numbers. Uh, trans is directly linked to poverty. And that has a lot to do with the fact that a lot of trans and non-binary people can't find employment because of the way that they express their gender. There's a lot of suffering attached to being trans or non-binary, just as there's a lot of suffering attached to being a woman in our society. So we need to start exploring these different gender identities, exploring ourselves, and accepting ourselves and accepting each other. And the more comfort and freedom we can have in expressing ourselves and, our, and, and crafting our own gender, gender identities, the happier we are all going to be in the long run. Because enforcing gender on people leads demonstrably, materially, there's plenty of evidence it leads to suffering and misery. But allowing freedom of gender expression, it's liberating, and I feel liberated. Now that I finally can come to terms with this battle I've been fighting since I was very young, since I was a five-year-old boy, and I was playing with my you know, the little boys that are my cousins or my classmates, and they're all being very aggressive, and I would rather go play with the girls, but I can't do that because they don't, they don't want me over there, the teachers don't want me over there, I gotta play with the boys, I'm getting bullied by the boys, I'm not fitting in with the boys, I'm suffering all throughout my childhood. And then when I get into my young adulthood, I'm suffering because, you know, I want long hair, but everyone around me is telling me that men can't have long hair, and I wanna dress a certain way, but everyone's telling me that that looks too girly, and I wanna do these things, but, you know, I'm afraid to do it in pub and be public about it 
because I'm afraid I'm gonna be judged for not being masculine enough. This is a battle I've been fighting my entire life. And now that I finally understand that I'm non-binary, it's like a huge weight lifted off my shoulders. And it doesn't even really matter in my day-to-day -day life. You know, I'm in a relationship with a woman. I have a beard. I tend to dress in a more masculine fashion. Uh, but internally, it means a lot. It, it, it makes a huge difference just to be able to know that it doesn't matter if I live up to that standard of a man. And it doesn't matter if I enjoy doing things that are traditionally described as womanly things to do. It doesn't matter. And I, and I can be comfortable with that and I can live my life with real freedom and liberty now. And I have language and I have a framework, a theoretical framework to understand what's happening in my own brain. And that's pretty cool. So, hey, this is all just the very, very basics. Again, I'm not an expert on this stuff. I'm just sharing what I have learned and I'm sharing a little bit of my personal journey. There's people who are much better at talking about this stuff, you know, fuck that whiteboard, man. It's been getting on my nerves this whole video. Anyway, thanks for watching the video. I'm American Johnson. This is Non-Compete. Be sure to subscribe, uh, support us on Patreon, and watch the stuff in the description because it's better than this crappy video. Bye. You know, in several girls' colleges, they have a course in good grooming for which they give regular college credit. And believe it or not, one full period is devoted to teaching girls how to wash their faces. But you don't need to go to college to learn that. But I don't see how things like that and posture and mannerisms and the other things will make a girl more popular if she's not pretty to begin with. Sometimes I'd like to shake you girls when you worry so much about being pretty or not being pretty. As though prettiness were a woman's only attraction. If you'd spend just one month doing everything I talked about to make the most of your appearance, you wouldn't need to worry about being pretty or popular. I wish that I could wave a magic wand to show you what the difference would be. Presto, like that. Why, it does work. You will be prettier. You will be more popular. Good grooming will pay dividends to each and every one of you. It will make you more confident and at ease in any situation. Well, call that poise or charm, if you will. It will make you more attractive to the people around you. Call that glamour popularity, if you like. Remember, at home, at school, or on a date, any time and every time, appearance counts. Make it count for you by doing your best to look your best. Success today and tomorrow is surer and easier with good grooming.